Okay, well, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Shauna Nesbitt, Associate Dean of Student Diversity and Inclusion and Professor of Hypertension here in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Division of Cardiology. I'd like to welcome you to our first lecture in this series of anti-racism lectures. This is a topic that over the past three to four months, students have requested, faculty have asked for. There have been small conversations being had throughout our courses and, and small groups and of course by Zoom. And I felt compelled that in answer to the request that we ought to have didactic conversation about what this specific topic, topic really embodies and, and try to get our arms around what it means uh, such that we can move forward as a community, as a campus, and really as a society um, in, in the near future. I am so honored and really pleased to have our first speaker, who is Dr. Lundy Braun. She is a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine and Africana studies and a member of the science, technology and society program at Brown University and Alpert Medical School. She received her PhD from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And the overarching goal of her research is to analyze the historical role of science, medicine, and public health in the production of racial hierarchies. She has participated in national and international workshops on race, imperialism, genetics, and health. Dr. Braun has also organized an interdisciplinary working group on race, medicine, and social justice at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown University. She is the author of Breathing Race into, into the Machine, the surprising career of the spirometer from the plantation to genetics. I am so happy to present to you Dr. Braun, whose title today is Race Correction and Medical Algorithms, a Historical Perspective. Dr. Braun. Let me just... Okay, well, does everything look okay? Yes. Well, my sincere thanks go to Dr. Nesbitt for inviting me to speak to you today. And I'd also like to thank um, Ms. Greta Epps for handling the logistics in such a smooth way and being so responsive to sometimes my quick and panicky emails. Um, I think it's gone very well, and I want to thank everybody in media technology, Paul Clyde, Clyde um, and many others who are working behind the scenes. And I've put on these webinars, and I know how much work it is behind the scenes. My talk will focus on how racism, as um, Dr. Nesbitt just said, on how racism actually works in medicine, taking a historical perspective. With this history, I will center my talk on two examples. And there's many, many examples, and they're growing. But I'm going to talk about two um, examples of race correction based on algorithms, uh, lung function and kidney function. I'll spend more time on the lung function in part because I spent 10 years researching it. Um, but a paper was just um, is was just accepted on kidney function. So for the first time, we're going to be able to talk more and, and compare race correction of kidney function and lung function um, to a certain extent. Um, interestingly, algorithms are, um, race-based algorithms are an issue that has reached the popular press um, in maybe the past year. Um, and is under investigation right now by Congress, um, as I will discuss in a moment. So to step back, or to step into the present, let's say, um, we've all heard um, almost as a necessary byline in news articles and journal, biomedical journal articles, 
that the appallingly high death rate for African Americans from COVID-19 has brought to the fore the various manifestations of structural racism and how, how it offers, operates in US society. While there's still much that we do not know about post-virus interactions, we do know that low-wage workers, especially Black and Latinx workers, were affected in profoundly in various ways. So just for example, the massive closures of um, day childcare centers inconvenienced um, many of us, but it also meant um, that many people um, in this low-wage industry lost their jobs. But there was something else going on in the emergence of a new and complicated category of people that we call essential workers uh, that has emerged during COVID. A small proportion of this group earn high wages, like some healthcare providers, but the largest proportion in this category is another category of low wage workers, mostly Latinx and black workers that work in nursing homes, grocery stores, drive Amazon trucks, slaughterhouse workers, those delivering food to homes and many others. And with less than um, ideal or even minimal protection, um, personal protection. And I'm just reminded by a video that one of my colleagues showed me about one of her relatives who worked in a nursing home with the nursing home employees begging for them to not take away the personal protection that they did ha have and, and send it elsewhere. Um, I mean, those, those screams still resonate in, um, in, in my mind from that. So I, I think we don't want to underestimate quite how anxiety producing it has been for the people who are um, serving uh, many of us who have stayed home under semi lockdown or lockdown um, conditions but that's at the price of many other people. So many essential workers are risking their lives so that others of us can live safely, if not happily, um, with our incomes uninterrupted by working at home. Consequently, Consequently, we see data like this from early in the epidemic um, that was actually exposed by investigative, investigative journalists. And we see that um, there's higher overall mortality among Black and uh, Black, Latinx. Uh, there, and that's true for um, all age groups. And we see that there's, it's not shown in this slide, but higher, higher hospitalization rates. And there's marked regional difference. And I think we need to pay a lot more attention to regional differences, but we actually don't always have um, terribly good um, data on, um, on this. So, but nothing that has been revealed thus far uh, about the burden of disease in, is new to people who live the reality of low wage work. Uh, substandard housing and structural racism in US, US society. The rea re this reality is quite difficult for many of us who live in segregated um, neighborhoods. And it's just hard to imagine quite how, um, how challenging this environment has been for um, for people uh, trying to deal with COVID. And I think one important point that David Williams has made many years ago is that uh, what segregation does is it con concentrates resources that are necessary for good health. So some of us have more resources than we actually need. Um, and 
you know, there's a large literature looking at that, but then um, others have much less than, than they need. So David Williams referred to this um, segregation as a fundamental cause of racial disparities and disease. And what a fundamental cause it is, is, or what it implies is that you actually have to deal with that. Uh, you have to deal with that fundamental cause if you're going to end disparities. Uh, so I've used, I'm not doing this too well. Okay, I guess, no, now I'm going backwards. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I, I see. Somehow this is just, okay. So I've used the phrase structural racism uh, several times already in this talk. And let me just define it. Uh, this is a definition that I like, and there's many definitions out there, but I think it's a particularly, um, it's one that's in, all in, well, encompasses a lot, but isn't so all encompassing that we can't tease apart what are the elements of structural racism. And it's um, in an article published by Rachel Hardiman and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine in October uh, 2016, so four years ago. And they wrote that structural racism is a conflict of institutions, cultures, history, ideology, and codified practices that generate and perpetuate inequity among racial and ethnic groups. And what they go on to note is that one of the first things, and this is particularly focused on uh, education for healthcare providers generally, and they say we have to learn about, understand and accept the United States racist roots and how our historical notions of race so the categories we um, we use, and some and oftentimes use those categories in unthinking ways. Um, how these racist roots about race have shaped our scientific research and practice, and I think this is sort of the fundamental point I will make about the, in this talk: is how has racism shaped scientific research and practice? And they also include, and this was really quite um, a brave. Uh, move is that it shapes how, how racism, that we need to understand in more depth how racism has shaped our narrative about disparities. And, and then they go on to say researchers have long used rhetoric implying that in differences between races are intrinsic, inherited, or biological. They call for naming racism, and I think since the publication of this article, it's been much easier to do that in medical settings. Rather than use um, euphemisms, we can now say, this is racism. And, um, and that, I know in, in my teaching, I can you know, point to this is published in New England Journal of Medicine. So we can really think about what were these authors saying. And speaking to the margins refers to um, bringing people who are marginalized into the research enterprise um, more um, in, in much more depth. There have been attempts to do that, but there's a lot that we need to do. So this definition of structural racism raises the question, of course, the large question, is it embedded in US and global medicine? And then the questions then, because we can't just say, oh, it's structural racism or it's racism. We have to say, how did racism get embedded in medicine? How did this even happen? And how does racism operate on a routine basis? It couldn't be operating on a routine basis if, there, if it was easy for all of us to see. And you know, I think when I say I spent 10 years on this book, it's partly because teasing apart the various ways in which racism operated in lung function measurements was really challenging. And a student that I worked with at the time um, ended up stopped working on the project with me because he said, I just, I don't know what I think. 
And, you know, that was fair enough. This was difficult. Um, so why does it persist? And then why does attention to racism in, in medicine actually fluctuate? So this isn't the first time I'll mention W.E.B. Du Bois um, in 1899, who was writing about the, this topic. This is certainly not the first time that people have paid attention, but it waxes and wanes. And I think we have to do a better job of understanding why. So in last October, um, there's an article published in Science, um, Dissecting Racial Bias in an Algorithm Used to Manage the Health of Populations. And this article, perhaps because it was published in Science, uh, created a huge media um, flurry. There's so many articles. If you just uh, Google that, the, name, the title of that article, you'll get a slew of articles. Um, that some of which were, you know, really quite helpful. But um, what what happened in this algorithm is that the those that were developing the art algorithm didn't even use race. But because they used a way of um, determining who should get more care that involved who had come in to clinics most frequently, and as it turns out, white people came into clinics more frequently than uh, black people did, they ended up discriminating against black people. And this was um, a company called Optux, and it it operates in 40% of health systems across the country, um, including in, um, in Rhode Island. So I became quite familiar with how this worked, but um, it really created um, a major uh, concern. And, and what was interesting is science, for maybe one of the first times, had an accompanied artic accompanying article by Ruha Benjamin, um, titled Assessing Risk, Automating Racism. And she had just published a really superb book on race and technology. And um, she wrote a, a lovely article that um, would, would get, tried to get into the social um, dimensions of algorithms. Uh, so that was last October. And then it kind of died down by January. And that in part, um, to be fair, was due to, um, due to COVID that was just starting to hit the country. Uh, but it also is due to the fact that these um, interest in racism medicine has waxed, waxed and waned so much. Um, it's difficult to wrestle with, in part because we think of medicine as a healing profession. Um, most people that go into any aspect of uh, medicine think of themselves as healers. And, uh, and so it's, it's healers, and then the knowledge base of medicine is considered objective. So, you know, how could there be racism? In August, um, Darshali Vias and um, colleagues wrote an article called Hidden in Plain Sight that is receiving a lot of attention in medicine. Um, and they call for reconsidering the use of race correction in clinical algorithms. Uh, this, this, was, uh, this article was followed up. Well, actually, Cory Booker had already um, been somewhat on top of algorithms, so he had already started investigations, and then he really intensified them. So Elizabeth Warren, um, Ron Wyden, Cory Booker, and Sandra Lee uh, were questioning the use of race-based algorithms in standard medical practice, and they've been doing so in Congress um, a lot. And then, um, and then Congressman Neal from Massachusetts uh, requested that medical professionals write him letters arguing, uh, showing why, well, where algorithms were in medicine, why this is a problem. 
So that's the second part of, we have to both show that racism um, exists, but is this perhaps helpful to patients? And there's been a lot of attention to racial disparities and disease. Is this just sort of another form of addressing racial disparities and disease? And, you know, I've just sort of briefly um, noted here that since research provides the clinical basis for clin the evidence base for clinical practice and new research directions, we have to always be critically examining the nature of scientific evidence for everything. I mean, we, we, and we do do that, but with regard to race, racial categorization, and racism and its history, or we risk reproducing the past. So I do think, um, and I'll mention this again with um, kidney function, there is no quick fix. And we can, um, there's been activity asking for removal of the race-based multiplier from kidney function uh, testing, and that's great, but we actually have to do more um, moving ahead. So I'm going to focus now on the history of race correction of lung function measurements, history of race correction of kidney function measurements, and then ask as a big question towards the end, how did white um, measurements become the norm? So I first became interested in, um, in lung function and race correction of lung function by reading the Providence Journal, who would have known, um, at the kitchen table in March 26, 1999. And I probably wouldn't have noticed this article because that's when I was getting children off to school. It was a busy time of the day. But this one really caught me in my eye. And it caught my eye for several reasons. One is that I was in a race and medicine workshop um, directed by Evelyn, a historian of medicine, uh, Evelyn Hammonds. And so I was learning, I was just beginning to learn um, about um, racism in medicine. But I was also teaching um, medical students pathology at the time, I taught for 20 years, and uh, they wanted to know more about. Um, race, race, how race worked in medicine. And, you know, this is 1999. So student activism is not new, actually. It's been going on for, for quite some time. It's gotten it's sharper and many more people are involved, but it's not new. So I was reading this article and it said um, that Blacks uh, were, were suing former asbestos workers um, for they were suing for compensation, and what had what in this case there was a huge asbestos lawsuit against Owen Corning um, Company, but it the company was barring black workers, black asbestos workers, from um, compensation, and the basis on which they did it, they turned to the science. And they said that the consensus of the scientific opinion was that Black um, people in general had lower lung capacity than white people. So in other words, um, Black workers were going to have to meet a different standard. Uh, so the question this posed to me, I mean, and it took time for this to become really clearly posed to me, but is average lung function lower in black people than white people? And I get that question over and over and over. And I think as, as we go through, the, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a, a sense why I think that isn't actually the question. Um, but let's even say difference is, there was difference on average. Um, is that innate or environmental? And then what are the implications of just correcting. Um, and we'll see. I, I'll be interested in, in uh, your responses. 
So this is for those of you who haven't seen a spirometer. This is one, the spirometer on my left is a, a fairly old fashioned one from my um, primary care doctor's office that I took a picture of in 2005. Uh, and I want you to just note that there's two um, options that the um, spirometer, that the provider has to, uh, two buttons the provider has to press in order for the spirometer to operate. So if you don't do that, it just, you won't get a readout. So one is race and the other here is sex. And what, what's, well, one important piece of this is that the options for race are, um, there are two options in this parameter, white and then everybody else in the world. And there are a couple other um, standards embedded in this machine. I went and back and looked at the spec sheets. For the um, spirometer on the right, which is a more modern spirometer, but it's about the same time, um, I, it, you can see the little spirometer up in the right hand corner, and then the options are in the printout mass menu. So there the options were, quote unquote, Caucasian, and, uh, and then African, and then Mexican. And when I, I was in a rural South, South Africa where I saw this spirometer and then I talked talk to the manufacturer. And what was quite interesting is I thought it immediately if it's um, Mexican and African and quote unquote Caucasian, then it must be a US manufacturer. But in fact, it was a South African manufacturer that wanted to market um, the spirometer in Latin America, because you can tell it's a, a, a small little, it was actually quite innovative, and this um, manufacturer was quite innovative. But the point here is that the standards embedded in the spirometers differ. Um, and so there's what choices are being made for what standards are in a spirometer in the first place. And then of course, what's, what issues to standard selection raise? Um, and can we resolve the problem of race correction of spirometry by, uh, and the embedded issues of race by just improving standardization? And this is a, a, just a little diagram I put together to try to show what the consequences are in workman's compensation cases. Um, so I have, you know, so-called normal up at the top and then um, disability, a disabled um, spirometric measure in red. And for white workers, normal is considered higher than for black workers. And so, they have to show, black workers have to show how um, more damage than white workers do. And I think this is kind of clear, um, but, but uh, well, it's clear, but I also um, welcome questions because it's, it's very confusing to people who have encountered this um, initially. There's actually two types to make, make a very complicated story um, even more complicated. There's two types of race correction. In, in Europe, it tends to be called um, ethnic adjustment, um, but the language means the same thing. Uh, one is a scaling factor, and uh, the scaling factor involves multiplication of between 13 and 15 percent of the white norms for African Americans. Um, and then more recently, there has been some attempt to racially correct for Asians, although what is what counts as Asian has, hasn't been um, addressed at all, but there is a different standard for, for Asians and for African Americans. So there's a scaling factor, multiplied by 15% or 6% or any percent. And then there's embedding in the um, 
in the spirometer population specific standards. And this seems to be more palatable because it, the hierarchy of um, whiteness isn't so immediately apparent. But I would argue is that social assumptions about normativity are built, built in hierarchical assumptions are built into both kinds of race, race corrections. So there's conceptual and technical complexities, just to summarize a few um, points in this complicated story related to race correction and its interpretation. Spirometers have different standards, and this is true for across the world. Um, professional societies themselves use a combination of standards. The operator provider doesn't always know what standard the patient is being compared to. There's a wide variability, and I, um, I interviewed uh, quite a few people, about 26 or to 30 people, and there's a wide variability in how the, the technicians or providers determine race of the patient. I mean, one, um, one person who's a dear um, physician uh, in Rhode Island said to me, I just ballpark it. And actually, that's what most people do. Um, the groups on which standards are developed are not always well defined. And I did look at this quite systematically. Um, standards for groups may not match patient self-identification. Um, lung function varies over time and in different uh, geographic locations, so standards become obsolete, um, but frequently are not updated. And then what is race? What is race that goes into this um, machine? So let me talk now a little bit about the history of the idea of black white difference. Uh, and I'm going to just try to go through this um, fairly quickly. And, uh, but it is important to see how not, um, not questioning and then not listening to people who do question matters. So um, the first mention that I can find, and I'm, I'm not at all sure that this is, um, that Thomas Jefferson is the first, but uh, the first mention I can find about a difference, a racial difference, is Thomas Jefferson in his notes on the state of Virginia. And um, any of you who've read it know that it's quite an unpleasant read. Um, but he, in noting all these different um, differences between uh, white people and enslaved people, he, um, he noted that there was a difference of structure in the pulmonary apparatus. And then he went on to speculate about where, wh who this person might be. So, but it was a difference in structure of the pulmonary apparatus. Now, this um, idea might have just disappeared and been in the dustbins of history, uh, but it was picked up by um, uh, Samuel Cartwright, whose work is really ugly and um, incredibly hard to read. Uh, I, I basically read it once, took notes, went back, and uh, tried to uh, verify those notes, but uh, I never went back to it again. But he wrote, and it was quite significant, uh, even though he's not cited. And I'll talk about who's cited and who's not. But the expansibility of the lungs is considered less in the black race and the white race of similar size, age, and habit. So he did some kind of controlling. And then he, he labeled this difference um, deficiency. And then he quantified it at 20%. And you know we're still doing that in many spirometers um, nationwide. So Cartwright was the first to use um, the categories of race to actually quantify in empirical studies. The next person, but this person 
at first glance looks kind of um, a little, I mean, it doesn't, he doesn't look as ugly and vicious um, and racist as um, Cartwright. Uh, and it's Benjamin Apthorpe Gould who picked up on this work in, uh, on Civil War. Um, he did a, a huge, huge, huge anthropometric study of Civil War soldiers. And uh, it's 600 page um, volume with, oh, I counted at one point the, um, and I'm forgetting it now, but I, the, with, it's a book filled with tables. So it's tables with very little explanation. Unlike Cartwright, who had lots of explanations. But what's interesting, and I looked in archives and I can't find any reason for this, but Gould um, devoted a whole chapter to um, lung function. And he compared lung function in white soldiers in two different series of white soldiers, um, of sailors, of students, what he called full black, what he called mulattoes and Indians. So he had these categories of people where elsewhere he did, and in fact, in letters that, that I did uncover, he admitted to the messiness of the categories, but he went on and, um, and just used them. And this work, his work is still cited in the present day. So he, in his uh, explanation, he writes that the great difference in mean volume found for the black race from that which belong, seems to belong to the whites cannot fail to attract attention at first glance. Its bearings are perhaps better manifested by the more detailed tabulations which will follow. And so it's table after table after table. I do want to just note quickly that that Gould's work was picked up by um, Charles Darwin in The Descent of Man. And he he, uh, f he focused a lot of attention on cranium, a cranial capacity, but he also um, focused on lung capacity. Now this work, um, and later there's another very racist, ugly diatribe by Frederick Hoffman, but this work did not go unnoticed. And I wanna, and I think this is the importance of, of questioning is um, Kelly Miller, um, leading black um, mathematician in the country in the late um, 19th century, and W.E.B. Du Bois uh, at the same time were all over this notion of lung capacity differences between um, black people and white people. And it, this, um, it, Kelly Miller's it, small monograph is available on Google and it's well worth a reading to see what people were saying at that time. I can't say that uh, they were listened to at that time, but they have um, inspired many, uh, many of us, myself included, to do this work and go into more detail. So by the end of the 19th century, the idea of racial difference in lung capacity between black people and white people was circulating widely. And I have a lot of evidence for that in, in my book. It was marshaled in hotly contested societal debates over emancipation in explicitly and more subtly. And it was acquiring an evidence base. Um, so what was this evidence base that has been so important that we're still dealing with? Um, this is work that I published, Defining Race, Ethnicity, and Explaining Difference in Research Studies in 2013. And I just want to give you a very quick picture that there were studies done in 2020 that were seminal to the later work and innate difference was a major explanation for why there was lung capacity differences. And then it picked up, um, publication on this topic picked up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and continuing into the 2000s. This work only went to 2008, so we don't know if it really is, um, represents a real decline. What I do want to say by the 1960s, innate difference was a common theme, but, it, um, but there were other 
explanations kind of thrown almost as a laundry list of explanations in articles. So they didn't really influence how people thought about difference. Um, the key point for this research is that of only 13% of articles even defined race. So we have an evidence base that involves most researchers, 87% of researchers not defining race, the central value variable for comparing um, black lung capacity to that of whites and very little attention to social economic status. And the explanatory frameworks are illustrated here. And we gave credit for anything. So it doesn't really represent what the, um, what the researchers meant. I didn't want to get into meaning in uh, just reading a biomedical article. That came out in interviews. But the point I want to make is there was an increase you see the red at the um, for no explanation. There was an increase in no explanation, and this is something I think we need to think about. What when there is no explanation, what does that mean? But inherent, the pink um, bar, and then anthropometric, the blue bar, both of them pretty much meant innate difference. Um, but I separated them for analytical purposes, but um, they dominated. So this barometer has a history. The history is intertwined deeply with race and white supremacy, and that early racialization continues to the present in the form of race correction. That is, it's programmed into the device. I will just, to move along, um, quickly note that uh, 1974 was when um, a team of researchers, Charles Rossiter and Hans Weil, proposed a uh, they both proposed a, a correction factor and they ruled out social economic status as cause. Again, there was little contestation. I mean, no contestation really since Du Bois and Kelly Miller until, um, un, until Johnny Myers in South Africa in the midst of um, anti-apartheid struggles proposed differential ethnic standards for lung capacity or one standard for all. So, but US literature doesn't, rarely cites the South African literature if, if it's read. And then in 2010, we see um, a, a viewpoint in race correction and pulmonary testing citing Gould uncritically and proposing a race-based model. So let me quickly go over um, e.g. estimated glomerular filtration rate, or which is the um, method of assessing kidney function. It, kidney function too is race corrected. And as some of you probably particularly students will know that there's been a major movement across the country to abolish race-based medicine and kidney disease and beyond. And this is an article from the San Francisco Chronicle that really, I think, um, set a fire in, in many parts of the country. Uh, there has been abolishment, including uh, at Lifespan, which is um, the testing lab at um, for Brown Medical, Albert Medical School. And so it is, but there's a lot of debate about it. And this is an example for those of you who haven't seen it, why in some ways EGFR presents different kinds of consequences. So this is my medical portal and I can show it because it's in the normal range and there's not much, um, much, much detail here. But what it does say is if African-Americans multiply, then you should multiply for 1.2. Now, in talking to um, clinicians, many of them, because extra work, don't multiply. So whether this has been really implemented in a uniform way, I think is quite unclear. But nonetheless, this is on a patient portal for any patient to see. And I've had lots and lots of questions from patients, both black patients and white patients, saying, what is this? 
um, it race correction of kidney function um, measurements dates to 1999 to only 1999 then it was updated in 2009 by the same investigators um, Andrew Levy and colleagues and the explanation they give in their paper was that black ethnicity was an independent predictor of higher glomerular filtration rate and that previous studies have shown that on average black persons have greater muscle mass than white persons. In other analyses they go on, we found that black ethnicity was an independent predictor of higher urine creatinine. So kidney function draws on creatinine for uh, the formula that is used to estimate um, whether it's in the normal range or not. There's a lot of complexities to this, and um, perhaps we'll have time in the, in the Q&A. But I think what is, is important is that the explanatory framework for, of muscle mass or of thinking that you don't even have to um, provide an explanation because it was done by these eminent researchers in 1999 then um, it, it's held and that is the dominant um, view. I would like to also say at this point that my guess, and I, I can't prove it, um, but that this work was partially done in response to the 1993 mandate by NIH to include um, people of different races and ethnicities and, um, and women. Um, it, gender was absolutely binary, uh, but that it, uh, I think it was a response to that sort of progressive um, move. So the chrono the, you can see the chronology here is very different and it really only increased um, in this systematic review that we did for, um, that's similar to the one we did for lung function, but had some differences. We only looked at uh, papers that compared black and white um, patients, and we separated out our reviews into estimated glomerular filtration rate, estimate for kidney function, and creatinine. And there's a technical reasons why we did that. Um, again, the um, there many, uh, a, a large proportion of people, uh, the researchers didn't define race, although we start to see an increase uh, in 2015, 16, when it was becoming um, mandated to actually define race. But the explanatory frameworks, let me just give you this quick look um, from this sample. So these are papers that did show difference so it's 38 papers, 28 out of 38 didn't even explain it. So we have a literature with the explanations, genetics, physiology, which is usually genetic, um, muscle mass mixed with in includes genetic and muscle mass. Um, and that's the literature we have right now is that mostly um, authors are not even explaining uh, why, why they, they think there's difference. So just in, to conclude, um, comparing what I've just had for the first time been able to do for this talk is to begin to really think about um, comparing race correction of um, estimated glomerular filtration rate or kidney function and spirometry. Both involve primarily black subjects. And this is absolute. It's across the board, actually, with many of the algorithms that are used. Both address difference in the supposed function of an organ. It's a fairly big um, comment to be making about organs and difference. Both contribute to genetic essentialism, whether ex explicitly or more implicitly. They have different histories. And this should be sobering to us for us to see you know, that we haven't put race correction behind us. 
we're still enacting it in ways that we aren't really aware of. Um, there's different social and political contexts for correction factors. Then, and there's different kinds of measurements. So in the case of lung function, it's a medical instrument. In the case of kidney function, it's a mathematical formula with a measurement of a serum molecule. There's very different visibility, and I find this really very troubling um, on the patient portal, port, patient portals. Uh, mathematical extrapolation is very visible to patients. What are they supposed, what it conveys is different, plain and simple. Um, race correction of kidney functions more easily abolished, but is it going to be a kind of whack-a-mole thing is you get rid of one setting and it pops up in another. So race correction enacts a hierarchical process that from my perspective, it simply must end. Any scientific measurement with people labeled white at the top and innate genetic difference as a frequent explanation for any so-called deficiency should at least give us pause. There is no biological, social, or cultural hierarchy. And I do want to just um, note uh, a sentence or two sentences from sociologist Troy Duster, really a very eminent person in the field of race and uh, medicine. And he published this paper in Science in 2005. And, and notes, it's about knowledge production. Um, the procedures for answering any inquiry into the empirical world determines legitimacy of claims to validity and reliable knowledge. But the prior, prior questions should always be, why that particular question? The first principle of knowledge construction, he goes on to say, is which question gets asked in the research enterprise? And so I would like to end with that, thanking my collaborators in both projects. Excellent, Dr. Braun. Thank you so much for an enlightening and um, intriguing presentation. Um, we've got at least a couple questions. Don, if you will read the questions from our chat box, that'd be great. Yes, thank you so much. So I do have a great question here. It says, thank you for the historical review, Dr. Lundy Braun. Perhaps I missed this, but what were race-based medical algorithms supported by the clinical data science when they were first proposed? Were they? Okay, that is, that's a great question. I'm really glad you um, asked it right now because I was sort of moving fairly quickly. Uh, and the point, and I, I try to get this through, and it's hard for us to imagine that we have all these race-based algorithms and that um, the science might be pretty iffy. To me, probably the most important um, piece of the work of the studies that I did is that um, is to point out that uh, race was not defined. So I said quickly that if you don't define the central variable of your research. That research is flawed. Would you think, you wouldn't think of studying a disease without saying, you know, well, how is that disease um, defined in the first place? So it's really crucial that researchers just left um, the definition up to whoever was doing the surveys or doing the studies. So there is a, an evidence base. What I would argue is this evidence base is flawed. The second piece to that question is how are we explaining difference? So with lung function, black workers, um, it's well known, there's lots and lots of evidence that black workers work under worse conditions than white workers. And so in an asbestos factory, this is very true. So I, can imagine that on average workers in that factory would have um, difference. So it matters how you explain. Thank you for the question. 
Dawn, do you have other questions in the chat box? No, not at this moment. I, I have a, an interesting question uh, that, that really boggles me is that it, it seems that the assumption is that if you are black, that there is no uh, genetic dispersion. And in, in, in other words, the assumption is that um, you're all the same. And yet we know that culturally speaking, even what we de define as being white in the United States is a mixture of German, English, Spanish, uh, you know, all, all entities of, of European culture. And the same is true when you about, you know, those who are descendants of, of Africa, i.e. African Americans, that the historical accounts of where the slaves were brought from is really all over a, a large part of the African continent. Has there been work to look at, you know, specifically the differences along the lines of um, pulmonary function, specifically, um, and, and also even GFRs within the continent that would suggest that there's difference even within those populations? The studies haven't been done in the way they need to be done to answer that question. I think, I mean, this is a problem for racial disparities research writ large is that we're assuming that everybody um, labeled or who self-identifies or is labeled black, everybody who self-identifies or is labeled white um, are the same. And I don't know who of us really identifies in that kind of hom homogeneous way. I mean, we do know that the continent of Africa has more genetic diversity than elsewhere. I think that evidence is, um, is fairly strong. And so actually, people, descendants of the African co continent should be homogenized in this way, the least. Yeah, I mean, and the other part of it is, as we go forward as a, a culture in America, more and more people are identifying themselves with more than one quote unquote race, um, you know, two to three races at one time. And if we're gonna continue to use these sort of really crude uh, definitions, how will we continue to use them in a culture where people are two races or three races in the same uh, box. It's a, a little bit puzzling. Yeah, it's Dawn. Dawn, do we have okay, other yes. questions? Yes, we do have a question that came. What resources would you recommend for medical students to learn about instances of structural racism in medicine? Is there some database that breaks up instances like the ones you rec the ones you mentioned by area of medicine or specialty? No. Um, but that actually is, is something that's desperately needed. So there are for our books, um, there's various kind of bibliographies for graduate students, like in Africana Studies. And I have one of those that has um, from a student. Uh, but what we need are some compilation of the articles that are out there. And there's really a lot of good articles. Um, so I, I mean, it would be a really good collaborative project to look at the various specialties. I should just start do, getting some of it on paper or in one place, because I teach this and so I do, but that's actually nudging me big time but I'd love to work with anybody that wants to do it too. Great, uh, Donna, we have more? There is a comment, interesting indeed, lots to digest, more objective talks needed, but would have to overcome stereotypes and labels on both, all sides. Very true. Yeah, and that's, it turns out yeah. that's hard and that's what this history and the ways in which it's popping up recently. Um, many of the algorithms mentioned in the Hidden in Plain Sight are recent. Um, I also did 
you know, just a very quick study of fetal growth curves. It's, it's kind of, they're proliferating in medicine. So, Donna, we... Okay, yep, one more question did come in. Sarcoidosis is continuously pathologized as lung disease of black females, while the specific cause is still unknown. Have you read the literature on sarcoidosis? Is there US and non-US studies? Yeah, so that there are. And actually sarcoidosis is, the highest rates of sarcoidosis are in Scandinavia. So it's not a black disease. I think that's, that's like plain and simple. The evidence is strong. I think Japan also has high rates. Um, I did publish a paper on the QBanks with USMLE, um, step one, and we have a whole paragraph on sarcoidosis there. So hopefully that won't continue to pop up so much. I think this question though illustrates a really important point is that we don't know things because we think we can just say, oh, it's one group has it. That's gotta be the whole issue. We don't know why is our code is higher in um, African-American um, African -American patients than in, in others and how much. So we're, we're approaching the, the close of our program, but I'll ask you one final question. Um, and that is, how do you see this process of, of racializing medicine really changing? One of the quotes in your book really struck me is racialized science produces racialized results. Um, and, and what do you see as our way forward? Well, I'm quite enthusiastic. I, I think I'm op cautiously optimistic, that's what I say all the time now. Um, and partly, I think optimism is important uh, to, to change and that thinking you can't change things, you know, stops it. So um, I'm optimistic about what students are doing. And they have, um, at my medical school, and I know medical schools across the country, they have for quite some time been saying, we want more in depth um, learning about racism. And it's starting to happen. It's not fast. And there's a lot of elements of, um, with faculty development. Um, and, but, and then of course, there's not always the literature that you wish was there, but students are, and I know this is true for, for um, nursing students, it's true across the country maybe some places more than others, but they're asking for a different kind of education. Great, well said. <laughs> well, thank you for your insightful lecture today. I, I think you've really given us a lot to think about. You've helped us to connect the dots between what we see and, and what has come before us. I think that's an important part of really understanding where we are today and, and trying to uh, conceptualize where we go to the next level. Um, I appreciate all the time you put into it and uh, you know your quick response to my request was um, really a surprise to me and I just want to thank you for your work. Yeah. To our audience, thank you all for joining us today. This is the first in our series. Our next talk in the anti-racism series is on November 2nd, that's Monday at five o'clock and our speaker for the evening will be uh, Professor Brian Fair, who is a professor of law at University of Alabama. And he happens to also be um, a, the chairman of the board of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, I hope that you'll join us then. And again, have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.